Hey, Mr. Pondball, Here we go. tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Here we go live. Greetings, everybody. Bob Lust, the Pond Boss, checking in. How in the world are you guys on this fine, balmy Wednesday? We got a little cold front coming here. Hope you guys are going to get a little mitigating weather. Looks like Jason Nipstad first up. Jose Latore checking in from Florida. Leo Wynn is watching from uh, way out yonder on the left coast, where Jose's on the right coast, and John Funk from Michigan. Nepstad is over there in North Carolina, so we've got a lot of folks checking in all over the place. There's Tim Stewart. He's in Florida as well. Kelly Duffy. Hey, Kelly. Good to see you, man. Uh, you guys know the drill. Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Click like. Share this video to your uh, timeline. And you'll be eligible for a drawing for a hat, for a Pond Boss hat. Look at that. How cool is that? Nice hat. And a Pond Boss mug that knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. And we have a winner this week, Gary Hempel. Gary's from Conroe, and uh, he'll be getting a mug and a hat coming in the mail. I've been thinking about what to talk about today. And when I was talking to the girls earlier, they were saying, well, what's your topic going to be? Well, I just spent a couple of days at the Purina Farm working with some of their dealers and trying to get them to understand the opportunity that... Uh, that they have in front of them. You know, I see Mike DeMint checking in from over around Memphis, Tennessee. Good to see you, man. Uh, so when I was at the Purina Farm, I gave a couple of speeches, and the speech was about Chris Horsley. Hey there, Bob, the Aggies won last week. <laughs> uh, which week are we talking about? John Funk, temperature's 58 degrees. Wow, that's pretty cool there in, in Michigan. Uh, our, it's, it's 94 degrees right here right now. I was in St. Louis Monday, Tuesday, left there this morning at four o'clock. It was like 82 degrees at five o'clock this morning when I left there. It was 95 there yesterday. So all this hot weather, boy, we, we're, uh, we're about ready. We're about ready for it to cool off just a little bit. So, uh, uh, what I was doing there, they asked me, the, the higher-ups at Purina asked me if I would come talk to some of their dealers about the opportunities that are out there for them. There's Daniel Hedrick, Mike Cottrell, Bill Russell. Good to see you guys. Lower Alabama, L.A. Yeah, 94 Yuck. That's right, Leo. So anyway, I sat down with them. I put together a little PowerPoint, and I spend a fair amount of time on Google Earth because when I'm helping design lakes for, for guys... The first thing I like to try to do is figure out, you know, how big is the watershed? What are the soils like? And then begin to do some due diligence for them to figure out just exactly what they need to do to build lakes. So I spent a little bit of time on, uh, let's see, I got to make sure I got my audios off because now I can see your questions a little bit better. And I spent a long time on Google Earth, and it, there was there was one feed dealer there from um, the middle of Ohio. There was one from Illinois, one from Washington, and so we spent a little time on Google Earth looking just to see. And dotted all over the place are these ponds right behind somebody's house. There's a dock, maybe a canoe or a kayak pulled up on the shore. Those folks want to manage their ponds. So I got to talking to them, you know, you guys are in the business to sell product, but people that have ponds and lakes want service. And so the more knowledge that you guys can get as dealers, the better you can handle the clients. And when the clients come in, you know, a customer comes in the store, they don't necessarily want to walk up and ask you a bunch of questions. So you, you know, if you know, if somebody comes up and they want to buy some game fish chow, or they want to come up and buy some Aquamax fish food, odds are high that somebody's told them about that. So engage a little bit, because if they've got a pond, they've got aquatic plant problems, they've got water chemistry issues from time to time, you know, they may, they may need the lime, and these are all things. So I'm trying to help these dealers build some relationships and take advantage of some opportunities that they don't even know they have. Let's see here, um, Chris Rigoni. Dave Weber, raining hard in northeast Kansas. You guys have gotten a lot of a lot of rain in northeast Kansas and northwest Missouri. Lots of happy water. <laughs> yeah, that's one of my that's one of my little catchphrases. We gotta have happy water. 
Scott McClure checking in from Lincoln. Four inches of rain in the last three days. Lows in the 40s this week. You know, that's good because here's what happens in the fall. When the temperatures begin to mitigate, the fish can sense that. And they sense it instinctively. Not necessarily because they think, because they can't. They don't think. But when their body temperature reaches peak performing, op peak operating temperature, they're going to get really active and they're going to feed. And they instinctively and innately sense that when the temperature's dropping, it's going to keep dropping. So they go on these feeding binges. I mean, right now, starting now until probably the latter part of November, depending on where you are, uh, fishing ought to be outstanding. You know, until the water temperature drops like John Funk's way down in the 50s. You know, when the, when the water temperature hits about 55, 54, 53 through there somewhere, the majority of warm water species of fish slow down when they're feeding quite a bit. But in the meantime, between now and then, they're going to feed like crazy if they've got plenty of food. So part of your job as a pondmeister is to take a look and see what your forage fish are like. Do that by checking lengths and weights on your game fish. Weigh and measure some of your game fish, smallmouth, largemouth, walleye, uh, yellow perch, you know, even channel cat. Weigh and measure some of those fish. And if their relative weights are good, then your food chain is probably pretty good. Now, I want to remind everybody, we've got the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology coming up. At the end of this month, I've got space for two more people, and we're going to get into that kind of topic in depth, literally in depth. We're going to talk about those things heartily. So let's see here. John Funk, that was the water temperature, Bob. Frost warnings. You know, I, I guess that's part of living in that part of the planet. There's Troy Todd. Drew Bachman checking in from the Carolinas. Good to see you, Drew. Craig Guffin. Tim Stewart, how many brush piles should I put in my half acre pond? It's seven to 10 foot deep, depending on the time of the year. I'm going to tell you, Tim, because I've seen the pictures. I've talked to you on the phone. What I think you should do is in a half acre pond, probably put, I'm going to tell you, put three or four brush piles, four feet wide, six feet long, four feet high. Now, I know you're not going to go out and measure that. I'm giving you some parameters of how much space to cover. So four by four by six. Now, if your pond was deeper, I'd say go up six feet. So you'd be within about three feet of the surface, but your pond's not quite that deep. So make sure that the brush that you put in is about four feet tall, four feet wide, six feet long, something like that. There's Jim Morgan checking in from uh, Kingfisher Society, Richmond Mill Lake. Good to see you, Jim. North Carolina. 98 degrees, I know, that's crazy. It was 101 in Montgomery, Alabama yesterday. I was in St. Louis yesterday, 95, 96 degrees in St. Louis. But it's fix, fixing to change, as we say in Texas. It's fixing to, fixing to change. There's Chris Ketchum checking in from Bells, Texas. Mark Dauber from Montgomery, Alabama. Mark, if you were sitting out on the porch yesterday afternoon, you guys had the high in the nation, 101 degrees. Christopher Aguilar checking in from South Louisiana. Ron Ardwan checking in from South Louisiana. Christopher and Ron, if you guys don't know each other, you will. <clears throat> hey, Frank James, good to see you. Jason Epstad, since you're talking about feed, <clears throat> I noticed if the feeder spits out too much food at once, some gets wasted. Four seconds for me. But if I say do three seconds at 7 o'clock and three seconds at 7.01, my fish are getting more food and no waste. Um... My experience, Jason, is that when that feed hits the water, it gets eaten. Now, when you say waste, I don't know if you mean the fish aren't getting that or what. So, uh, when I was at the Purina Farm yesterday, we took each group, I had two speeches, I t we took each group down on the dock, touched off the feeder, touched off the feeder, touched off the feeder. Those fish didn't quit. Now they, you know, they finally got to the point where they kind of getting full and weren't as, weren't as many as aggressive but they were still feeding hard and heavy. Yep, there's John Thompson. Hey, John, good to see you. Yeah, Christopher Aguilar, me and Ron will get some boudin and go fishing. You guys have the, you guys corner the market on the boudin. Okay, so it, the feed floats away. I don't know why it would do that, but if by feeding in one minute apart increments works, that's what I do, which I don't know why it would be that way. Let's see, the oh, Jim, Leanne, there's Leanne checking in. Good to see Leanne. Jim said the fishing has been good, though. That's good. You know, it's, uh, as, we, as we get into fall, things are going to change. 
Your fish are going to get more active. They're going to start moving shallower. They're going to start feeding more. You know, they're going to stop worrying about survival and start worrying about gaining weight. And that's what they're going to do. So be ready for that. Hey, Gary Hempel, guess who the winner is? You won the drawing. You did the hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Click like. Shared your video last week or week before or sometime. And you got a hat and a mug that knows how to keep hot things hot, cold things cold coming at you. Lynn will get that in the mail. Jimmy Pollard over there. He's in uh, near Tyler, Texas, over in East Texas. I'm still thinking about my down the hill pond build. The distance is about 150 feet downhill and at that point I need to do a dam. What do you say my dam should be made of? Clay, absolutely. Let's just kind of, let's just go down. Yeah, how about them saints? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> how many times has the saints won a game without scoring a touchdown? That's pretty weird. Um, there's uh, Fred Bingaman checking in on Connie's phone. Okay, so Jimmy, let's just let's just go through that exercise for a minute. When you guys get ready to build a pond, the very first thing, every time somebody talks to me about building a pond, first thing I do is I go to uh, uh, Google Earth and I find the spot and I start looking at it. And there's a program called MapRite where you can bounce between Google Earth, topos, things like that. So I go in and calculate the watershed, how much watershed feeds that site. And then how big can the pond be and should it be based on that watershed size? Because so many inches of rain coming down that watershed extrapolates to so many gallons, which tells you how big the pond should be. And typically over there where you are, uh, I would say that you should uh, probably have eight to 10 acres of watershed per acre of pond. So that's the first thing is check the watershed. The next thing is to make sure you've got clay. I start with soil surveys, but nothing, that doesn't take the place of getting on the ground, digging some holes, and see if you've got clay. If you can take some moist clay and start to roll it, and it rolls into a thread without coming apart, you've got pretty good clay. So yes, you have to have clay. Then the next step is to design the dam that's appropriate for that site. And typically we try to tie two high spots together and then tie the dam into those high spots, whether it's a hill, a hump, the side of a hill, whatever it is. And then that's 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 how you get started on that. There's John Wilson. Hey, man. Let's see here. Uh, Mr. Aguilar Boudin says, I've been having a, a time trying to recatch a big bass from last year, and she is stubborn. She's got you figured out. <laughs> I, don't know how to, I don't know how to tell you to break that deal. Let's see. Uh, John Wilson. Hi, Bob. Hi, John. Gary Hemp Hempel. That would make it a damned old hill. You know what? It would. There we go. So I started thinking about a topic for tonight. Let's see if I can see the new comments because my phone's messing up a little bit. There's Trana Madonna. Hey, Trana. Let's see. Um, Jimmy Pollard, I have a small spring at the top. Well, if you can, you know, now here's the thing about springs. You never want a spring below the water line in your lake or your pond because you run the risk of putting too much weight on it and making it run backwards. So as long as you've got water coming in from above and you can estimate the amount of water, the way you estimate that is to see if you can funnel it into a pipe, hold a five gallon bucket under it and see how long it takes to fill up that bucket and that tells you how many gallons per minute. You know, and so that's gonna make a difference on the size of the pond that you build as well. Let's see here. Gary Hempel's using possum tails for bait. Yep. Last time I caught a possum, it didn't want to give up its tail. Frank, as I belatedly discovered, often clay is found most easily underneath existing streams. You know, that's that's true. That's that's true. And clay is where you find it. You know, sometimes you think that that should be clay right there, and you start digging in it, and you find nothing but layers of sand and gravel. And as you dig more into it, you start figuring out, well, that's where the stream ran 3,000 years ago. Let's see here. Let me scroll a little bit and make sure I got this. Scott from Lincoln says, as the temperatures fall, is the best option for removing filament algae physical only? No, it is not. You can use uh, any any good algae side. And where you are, I'd use a chelated copper uh, compound. And I'd probably use liquid because it's, it, you know, you can kill algae in water all the way down into the 50s. 
Water temperatures were 67, but now our air temps are in the 50s and 40s, so I think it'll be near 55 water temps soon. Yeah, if you want to go ahead and treat that algae, go ahead and treat it. Knock it out. Now, here's the, here's the other side of that coin. Once the water temperature drops below 51, 52, the majority of your filamentous algae is going to go away anyway. It's going to go dormant. It's going to disappear. It's, you know, any living algae is going to die and rot and lay on the bottom. So you have a choice. If you want to go ahead and treat it so you can have quicker, better access to the water, treat it. If it's not urgent, leave it alone. Nature will do it for you. Let's see, Ron Arduan, you my buddy Bob, Saints won without Breeze. Yes, they did. The Cowboys got beat by a backup quarterback, and they didn't let them score a touchdown. We're not going to talk about that anymore, boys. <laughs> yeah, there's an invitation for you, right? Leo says, for a pond establishment, wouldn't areas with high clay content cause water quality issues for your aquaculture during wet seasons? Um, let me think about that. Not really. Clay is... Clay is for the most part inert. There's not going to be a lot of what is in clay that's going to create issues. It doesn't create issues. It's the things that are dissolved in the water from other sources like metals and minerals and things like that. Clay is typically just little colloidal chunks that are so small that they pack together really, really tight. Now, there are kinds of clay that end up suspended because the, the little colloidal pieces are so small, they're lighter than water. So at some temperatures, water stays muddy because of clay. But there's ways to mitigate that as well. But I don't know of any water quality issues with high clay content. Now, I'm talking about native clays. And the native clays that we have under the ground in the south and southwest part where I live there's nothing dissolved in that clay at all. Now there'll be stuff in the there'll be um, lime in the topsoils. Uh, there's kinds of clay that you find typically sitting on top of limestone rock, or there's some clays that you'll find that are intermingled with gypsum. You know, and so there's some clays that are sitting on top of iron rock. There's some that sit on top of coal, and vice versa. So the clay, for the, for the, as far as I know, is inert. It doesn't cause any water. I've never seen clay cause water quality issues. Matt Reardon, hi Bob, when should I add golden shiners into my pond? It's one acre big in southern Indiana. We'll have fathead minnows, bluegill, red ear, large, let's see, LMG, I guess that's largemouth bass and hybrid striper. Should I add in the beginning with my forage or after a year when I add the predators? I'd wait. I'd wait until after the... Because what you've done is you've stocked the fatheads. There's your jump start. Bluegill to the backbone. Red ear and insurance policy. And I think I would get the predator fish in there. And, because here's the deal. Golden shiners are predator fish. People don't really realize that, but they are. And they're fast moving and they're aggressive. Now, bluegill are territorial and they're, they're predators. They're carnivores as well. But I think I would put the shiners in after you put the predators in because you don't want your shiners eating baby fatheads. You know, the fatheads have got a purpose. So wait. Wait till you do your predator fish later. <laughs> There's Mike Collins. As long as we beat the Cowboys, I'm happy. Gary Hipple says the Dallas Cowboys no longer exist. Well, there's a guy, there's a guy from uh, Houston, Texans country. Gary Hipple. Tom Landry is the only coach they ever had. You know what? I'm still mad about that. And that happened in 1989. <laughs> That's crazy. I got a, a funny story. Back in uh, 1989, I was helping manage a lake over in East Texas, south of Athens. It was called the Rainbow Club, R-A-I-N-B-O. And there were two lakes. One was probably 60 acres, another one was 25 acres. And there were 15 members of that fishing club. And there were... Uh, one of them was Clint Murkison, who was the former owner of the Dallas Cowboys. There was a banker named Herb Schiff. And, and there was this guy there named uh, George Bush that was, uh, that was a, uh, an owner. And that's before he was governor of Texas, before he was president of the United States. That was in the you know, 80s, 88, 89, through there somewhere. And anyway, um, Bum Bright was one, of the, was one of the owners. And I went out there on a weekday one day to do some work. We were going to shock up a bunch of fish and move them from the big lake to the 
other lake because we had drained and renovated the, the, the smaller lake and cut a bunch of stumps out of it while it was down because the stumps were a hazard. People kept running into them in their boats. A couple of guys got ejected. They didn't like that. So we ended up uh, uh, shocking the lake and the caretaker told me, he says, hey, listen, there's a couple of guys out there in the boat fishing, this, which is not normal, so leave those guys alone and stay away from them. They're, they're, they're fishing and talking. I said, okay, okay, who, who is it? He said, well, it's Mr. Bright, who was the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, and he says, uh, some rich oil guy out of, out of Arkansas that's talking to him about buying the Cowboys. Well, come to find out, it was Jerry Jones, and they were out fishing in this lake that I was managing, and structuring, trying to negotiate and make the deal for him to buy the Dallas Cowboys, which I didn't I didn't think much about it at the time, but sure afterwards, I sure did. So let's see here. Let's Shepard Kennedy, longtime fan. Thank you for the Canadian education. Owner of All Clear Pond Management in Raleigh, North Cagalac. God bless. Good to see you, Mr. Kennedy. Ron Ardwan, I'm going to stick to fishing ponds from now on, I promise. Yeah, don't make a promise you can't keep, mister. John Funk, my pond is all clay and I've never had clear water, but the fish seem to do very well. One of the things about clay, you typically have clay in conjunction with other soils. Now, here's the way to look at that. When, when you're using clay to compact and build a pond, clay expands and it contracts. So when it's wet, it expands and it clings together better, but when it, when it gets dry, it cracks. So all the prudent, good, best pond builders, when they're building a dam or using clay to line a basin of a pond, they mix it with other soils so they can get good compaction, minimize leakage, but mitigate that expansion and contraction so much. So if, as, long as, as long as that soil is 30% clay, then it's gonna work and compact and do a good job. And that's what most of them are looking for. So uh, I don't remember where I was going with that, but. Oh, you never had, okay, so here, yeah, now I know where I was going. The, the, the soils that clay is mixed with to build a dam or on the surface of the bottom does have some nutrients and some minerals and metals that will end up dissolving into the water. And as long as the alkalinity is good, you're not going to have clear water. You're going to have water that's kind of green, got a little turbidity to it, and actually that makes it healthy water. Okay, so Frank James, let's see what Frank's saying here. I do want to do a three or four foot drawdown to flush out small largemouth bass and back bays for largemouth bass and hybrid striped bass. Usually have a slow running creek, so it should be okay during the cooler rainy season to refill. But this will this totally wipe out my good American pondweed? No, it will not. If you draw, if you draw your lake down three feet, start off at three feet. And if that draws it out of your coves to where the young fish can get out and, and, and uh, get eaten, which is your goal, you want your bigger bass to help you cull some of those smaller fish. That's what you're wanting to do. Even if you do get freezing temperatures that take out some American pondweed, those little bitty seed pods on top are gonna get, give you enough seeds, plus with the tubers under the, under the dirt, as long as it doesn't totally dry out, you got tubers and seeds. And even if it does dry out, you're going to have seeds. So the American pondweed will come back. Now what it might do is thin it out a little bit. And that's not bad. That's not a bad thing. Let's see. Um, and then Frank says, we'll have copper nose bluegill in my forage pond to help restock in spring. Brilliant. That's a great idea. I think that's a good management strategy. And I want to talk about designing a, a pond management plan here in a minute. Holy cow, I'm getting behind on the comments. Let's see. Aguilar, Dunn's Fish Arm will be here Friday, so I'm sad that I can't go. I know the fish will gobble up anything I buy. Hungry fish like to eat, especially this time of year. There's Zach Cook. Hey, Zach, Jim Morgan, tell them about George Jones getting fish from your truck for dinner. <laughs> well, that's this pretty funny story. Uh, there was a, a, a short period of my life, a few months, that I worked down at Danbury Fish Farm south of Houston. I was in my early 20s, mid-20s. And we got a call from this guy that uh, wanted to buy a few fish. He lived over at Combs Neal, Texas. And so uh, it, it was a representative of the, of, the, of the landowner. And so I talked to him and figured out what they wanted. And got a, an order put together and I put a trip together where we had like five stops. So I climbed on the truck that time and I made the first couple of stops and I got to Combs Neal, Texas. And there was an aluminum gate 
and open the aluminum gate and I pull in and man it's a narrow lane going between tall pine trees and I knocked the mirror off the truck going down the lane I, I, I was able to fix it later but I knocked the mirror off in, uh, on a tree trying to navigate through there and the, the guy that on the phone said you, you're going to go see George Jones and he's in a it'll be in a mobile home at such and such so I drove in it was by the time I got there it was after 12 o'clock and I pulled up and sure enough there's this kind of half tattered well maybe not that bad well mobile home so I, I climbed out of the fish truck big big lumber yard size fish truck so I climb out and I go knock knock on the door nothing no response so I knock on the door again no response and then finally after three or four minutes I can hear somebody moving around and after three or four minutes the door opens and there's George Jones the singer there's the real George Jones I mean how many George Joneses are there I figured this was just George Jones no this was this was the, po the possum well that was during the span of time that he got the nickname no show Jones well I don't know if he got the nickname but he was living up to it where he was canceling concerts, not going. He needed to get away and recharge and quit doing whatever he was doing that was making him not do what he was supposed to be doing. Well, I need to write that down. That was kind of good. So anyway, uh, he, he came out. He, he didn't have on a shirt. He was walking around in boxers. He went and put on some shorts and a shirt and flip-flops, and he came out, and he said, Can I see the fish? I said, You bet. So he climbed up on the truck, and we looked at the fish, and... He took the net from me and he snagged a few fish and, and uh, threw them out on the ground so he could eat them later. He, so he filleted some bass. So anyway, I got to take him back through there and he hopped in the truck with me and we went to stock those, the, the fish in his pond back there so he could catch them later. Then I brought him back up to the front, laid him out. And he picked up those fish that had been flopping in the mud for 30 minutes and he went and cleaned them. So there you go. That's a pretty fun story. I have all kinds of stories like that. You guys that come hang out with me at the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology, I got two more openings, just two, and I want to fill them. So let's get some people. Uh, let's get some people. You know, it's it's expensive, but it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. Let's see here. Um, Gary Hempel should have drowned Jerry. <laughs> Who knew, right? Who knew? Okay, let's see what Chris Horsey. Ooh, man, I'm getting way behind. Let me go here. Let's see here. Chris Orsley, Bob, I have a 3.75 acre pond in East Texas. I stocked 800 copper nose bluegill, one to three inches, and 300 red ear, one to three inches late March. I have been catching lots of copper nose, but no red ear. Should I add more red ear this fall? Yes, you understocked it. Stock more. Do I need to add more fat heads? No, you shouldn't. I would be feeding. If you, if you don't feed your fish, man, feed them now because they were gonna, they'll gobble up some feed. They'll gain good weight. You're going to get another spawn out of your fathead minnows in east texas and you're also going to get another spawn out of your bluegill in east texas so i would do that also I was thinking about adding 204 to six inch catfish is that a good idea it's a good idea if you like catfish and you don't mind them competing in your food chain in two and a half to three years because they will and you won't catch them you'll catch maybe 30 percent to 50 percent of them the others won't bite a hook and you'll lose some to attrition but you're gonna wind up with a bunch of five to seven pound channel catfish within four years. They're eating and competing this with the bass. So if you don't want that, don't stock them. But if you don't mind it, stock them. Even though I hate the cowgirls, that's an awesome story, Bob. Well, thank you very much. Debbie Dobbs, Lust, my girlfriend checking in. My pond is always greenish, Gary says. That's typical. Jeffrey Soto checking in. Frank James, thanks, you're welcome. Jeffrey Soto, hi, Bob, what's up? Man, I'm catching up. Let's see, there's Michael Gray checking in. Gary Hempel, Uncle George, and Jim Morgan says he uh, drove to the liquor store in his lawnmower. <laughs> that did make the news, and that was about the time that I delivered those fish to him. Inebriated, um, you know what? I woke him up a little after noon, and I can't say that he was inebriated, but I do know that he was there and nobody else was. And it took about five to 10 minutes for him to come to the door, so beats me i don't know i i wasn't paying a lot of attention back then i just thought it was kind of cool let's see here gary hempel i think copper nose bluegill spawn in december here you know what they might i've seen copper nose bluegill spawn in, in in my part of the country in january you get those bluebird days you know where the temperature is just right and you get sunshine and the temperature goes up into the mid 70s the water temperature rises bluegill will spawn i've seen it over and over and over 
7 o'clock. You know what? I do want to say thank you to Purina Mills for being a sponsor of this show. And I, and I do appreciate everything that they do for our industry. While I was there at the farm this week, uh, they showed me some research that they're working on. They've really ramped up some good research. You know, they've, they've been limited by facilities from time to time, and that's, 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 that's why guys like me have been able to work with them over the years to help them develop new fish foods and tweak the fish foods that they've got. Well, they've now got an aqua center, and they've also got a dock with some cages in the farm lake, and they're doing some feed studies to figure out uh, conversion rates to compare with other feeds to see how their feeds perform. They're uh, checking to make sure they got the right vitamin packages. They got the right, you know, fat content, things like that. So they're continually doing research and development there. And they spend a lot of time and a lot of effort on trying to do that. And they got a sharper focus on the fish foods. The fish foods that they have are outstanding products. I mean, just Richmond Mill, like Jim Morgan, for example. It never dawned on me, it didn't even enter my brain, that we might grow some two, two and a half, and even three pound bluegills in that lake. And if it wasn't for that fish food, we wouldn't have. You know, the, the lake's got the perfect environment, a great climate, diversified habitat, which is real important, and then you add that element of enough feed to feed enough fish to make it their primary source of food, you're gonna grow some really big fish. And that's what's happened. And Aquamax has done it. And, you know, and I also wanna thank Texas Hunter Products for being a sponsor of this show. Without them, I'd still do it. But <laughs> no, but I do appreciate Texas Hunter. If you guys want a feeder, Texas Hunter is the go-to company. You know, when you call them, they're gonna ship it that day if it's before two o'clock. Customer service is second to none. Uh, anytime I call or anybody calls, if there's an issue, they're on it right then and they take care of it. Hi, Brad Ron. There's Jacob West. Hey, Jake. Good to see you, man. Let's see. Gary says, my pond didn't get below 60 degrees to the best of my knowledge last year. Well, around Conroe, that's, I would expect that. You know, I would expect you to have maybe a few days in the 50s and that's going to be when an exceptionally strong cold front blows down and parks on top of you for a few days. You know where the high pressure goes away, the low pressure settles in and you get some moisture with it and you get some temperatures down into the mid thirties, you might see your pond temperature drop down to, to 50, 52, 55. That's why threadfin shad can live in, in that part of the planet. So the, the main topic I was gonna try to cover tonight is how to create a pond management plan. And it's, it's uh, you know, part of what I was telling these Purina dealers yesterday was now people build ponds with a purpose. I mean, we live on 12 acres. We have eight ponds, and every one of them serves a different purpose. We've got a swimming pond beside the house. We've got an experimental pond where we, we test different fish foods on different kinds of fish and see what the growth rates are. i got a couple of hatchery ponds that I grow bluegill or tilapia or rainbow trout in in the winter. We've got another little fun pond that I'll just, it's so small, I can pump it out in one day, you know, with a good big trash pump, get the fish out, and then completely revitalize the habitat, and within four or five days be filling it up again, ready to do something else fun with. You know, and so uh, people have ponds with purposes now. So if you're gonna create a game plan that's a, for your pond management strategy, the first thing you need to do is start with your goals. What are your goals? And be sure they're reasonable. You know, I, I don't ever want to hear somebody saying, I got a 10th acre pond and all I want to do is grow trophy bass. Well, you grow half of a trophy bass in a 10th acre pond. You still don't have enough space. So be reasonable. So set your goals. Your goals may be that you would like to have fish that the grandkids can catch. You want them to be healthy. You've got a two acre pond. The water chemistry seems to be fine because fish are growing in it. And you don't mind feeding. And you want to have a hiking trail around the pond. There's your goals. And write them down. And then in order to achieve those goals, you gotta figure out where you are. So you assess what you have. Is your water chemistry good? Do you have the right kind of habitat for the different species of fish that you want to grow? And if you don't have that, you can't, you can't money whip a pond that doesn't have good habitat. Now you can, you, can, you can grow some good fish, but when you stop throwing the big bucks at it, it's gonna quit doing what you've got it doing. 
You know, so you got to have the right habitat. Then you got to focus in on the food chain. You got to manage your aquatic plants. So create, create uh, your goals and assess where you are. And once you know where you are, then you can make a game plan to help you get to where you want to be. Now, making that game plan, that's going to be based on how much you want to do or how much you want to pay somebody to do. It's going to be based on your timeline and based on your budget. So figure out how much money you want to spend. Figure out when you want it to be like you want it to be. And then, then put your game plan together to do that. Now, your game plan is going to be focused on the, the basic five things first. The first most important thing is water. Without good water, like Dave, Dave says, happy water, you got to have happy water. If you don't have happy water, nothing else makes any difference. Once you've got, and you know you've got good, clean, healthy water for fishing plants, the next thing is habitat. You got to be sure you have the right kind of habitat. If you don't, create it. Then the third thing is, what are they going to eat? You got to have the right food chain. Or that's actually the, yeah, that's the third thing. Woo, where am I going? So yes, the food chain, that's a big deal. It takes 10 pounds of bait fish for a game fish to gain one pound. It takes 10 pounds of food for the bait fish to gain one pound. So at every trophic level, 10 times. So the food chain is going to be huge. For long-term management, once you've got everything else good, the water's good, the habitat's good, the food chain's good, but keeping that food chain good is going to be how you manipulate that fishery. It's how you harvest. You know, at some point, you're going to be harvesting fish. Pond's like a garden. So part of your game plan is to figure out healthy water, habitat, food chain, good genetics, Good genetics. I don't like hearing about guys in Michigan stocking fish that came out of Arkansas. Stock fish that are native to Michigan. Good genetics in Michigan. Use those. You know, use local genetics. Now, I don't mind if you want to use like Florida genetics or copper nose bluegill as long as your climate is parallel to what their native climate is. Then it can work. You know, and then, then, then the fifth concept that's going to be the ongoing one is harvest. If you're if you've got a pond, it's going to grow something. It may it may grow bushels of bushy pond weed. It may grow lily pads. It may grow snails. It may grow red ear sunfish bigger than your elbow. You know whatever your pond does well. At some point, there's going to be a bounty, and you're going to need to harvest some of it. So let's see here, Gary's. Let's see. I'm see some things passing me by. Gary's is Harvey mitigation. Boy, Harvey. Whew. That was a booger of a storm. There's Dion Myers again. Uh, Gary's grows willow trees. Let me tell you about willow trees. Willow trees, a full-grown willow tree, will translocate and evaporate 100 gallons a day. 100 gallons a day of water. It can absorb and allow the exodus of 100 gallons of water every day, a full-grown willow tree. The Boudin Man says, ain't nobody money whipping here. That's why I subscribe to Pond Boss. <laughs> Gary Hempel, crawfish. Yeah, crawfish? Crawfish are a great idea. Now, use native crawfish. Now, what Aguilar's going to have over there, he's going to have those red swamp crawfish, but Scott up there in Lincoln, don't take those crawfish up there because if they did thrive, they're going to beat up the native species of crawfish that you've got. You need to have the native kinds of crawfish, native kinds of bluegill, that sort of thing. So, uh, ain't nobody money whipping. I, I got a pretty. I think I think I've told this story before about the guy down around west of Houston that wanted to. Uh, he sold his company. He was in his 80s, and he said, "Son, I don't even buy green bananas. I'm not sure I'll be here when they get ripe. So I don't want to buy all these little finger length fish and stock into my lake that I hadn't built yet." I want you to help me design this lake, and when we stock it, we're going to really stock it right where I can go fishing like that day. And I said, well, it's going to be kind of expensive. He says, son, I don't care. Don't worry about it. Load the mule. I mean, load the wagon. The mule ain't going blind. Let's go. And so he said, uh, and I want a couple of great big fish. I said, they're going to be expensive. He says, money whip them. Well, some guys do that. Some guys don't. You know, the cool thing about Pond Boss is uh, 
You get the information that you need so you can figure out what you want to do and go get good at it and then go do it. So let's see here. I don't think I've missed anything. I'm going to scroll back here a minute. Oh, let's see. Aguilar said, the other morning I had to wait in the pond because my beetle spin was wrapped around a stump with a green ear sunfish on it. And I was kind of mad. Yeah, you know what? If you're willing to wait out there for a beetle spin to get it off the stump, you, yeah, yeah, you're not going to money whip anything, are you, buddy? <laughs> Except good boudin. <laughs> and you know where to get that. All right, let me make sure I haven't missed anything. I want to scroll back here because they've been coming pretty fast. Yeah, I think I got, I think I got everybody. If not, ask it again as I'm scrolling down. There's Tyler Cole checking in. Let's see, uh, Jonathan Stoddard says, we don't have much vegetation in our pond. Are there any water plants you recommend that won't take over? We have a one and a half acre pond in East Texas with a good bluegill, red ear, tilapia, and bass populations. Um, not sure what part of East Texas, but I'm gonna tell you what I like in East Texas. Now, depending on your water chemistry, if your water's real tannic, American pondweed might not do quite as well as it would if you have a little alkalinity, but I love American pondweed. That's one of my favorites. The, uh, another one of my favorites is eelgrass, and it will thrive in every pond in East Texas. You know, Jason Nipstad can give you a testimony about eelgrass. He's figured out where to buy it, but I don't know where you are in proximity to Athens, but Lake Athens is full of eelgrass, and uh, you can at least see, see what it's about, and I would get some of that. Now, here's the thing. We're in October now. The odds of you st uh, starting a plant, any kind of species of plant right now, is not good. You've only got about a month's window before those plants are gonna be going dormant anyway in East Texas. So I would be tempted to wait till next spring because you don't know what's gonna happen between now and then. We might be in a drought and the pond drop three feet and leave your plants high and dry and then they dry out and they die over the winter and get frozen out. You know, so the time to stock or to, to plant aquatic plants is gonna be in East Texas, probably in April. Now, you know, up there in the upper, oh, John Funk, if he's going to put any in the upper peninsula of uh, Michigan, he may want to do his like in the middle of May. You know, so use look at planting plants in your pond like you'd be planting plants in the garden. You know, you want to do it going into the spring, and that's a great time to transplant. Now, here's the, here's the catch. You're going to be either buying them or you're going to be digging them up. Well, where you're going to be digging up dormant plants, you better put some flags in there over the fall so you know where the tubers are so you can get in there with a fork or a, you know, a shovel and dig them up, put them in a bucket, and carry them where you want them to go because you're not going to have those plants that are alive in late February, early March when it's time to transplant or April. Let's see. Nipstead says, I think the turtles ate our grass that was in the cage. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Turtles will snip off plants right at the base. I've seen them do it to lily pads. I've seen them do it to eelgrass. And if you don't put if you don't put a cage around your plants to protect them until they get established, odds are pretty high that turtles are going to bite them in half. <clears throat> Let's see. Christopher says I caught a dinner plate sized snapping turtle Monday morning walking out of the pond. Dang thing had moss growing on its shell and its tail. Yeah, and it probably smelled kind of rank too. You know those things. Those snapping turtles are pretty cool because what they'll do is they'll get out into water, you know, X deep, and then they'll just start shaking back and forth and sink down in the mud. They open their mouth just enough for that little worm-looking thing off the end of their bottom lip to be wiggling around, and then they'll catch a fish when it swims up to eat that worm. So they do have moss growing on them. They got mud all over them, and they're pretty rank smelling too. Let's see, Chris says, uh, <coughs> what are some of the aquatic plants to avoid? Avoid anything that's exotic to your part of the planet. Uh, here in Texas, that would be, I would avoid uh, hydrilla at all costs. That's the most invasive, horrible plant ever for private water. And there's a handful of public lakes that it's good for, but most of them it's not. Uh, and avoid um, Eurasian water milfoil. <coughs> That's a real invasive plant. <coughs> um, other native plants can be invasive. Coontail. If you're not ready to deal with coontail by about year three, it can expand prolifically. Now, coontail is not a rooted plant. It migrates through the water column and it reproduces by fragmentation and then little sprigs grow off of each sprig. So I would avoid that. Gary Hempel, Evil Hydrilla. You know, 
That's the way I see it. <laughs> and most guys in my shoes see the same thing. Okay, so there you have it. So as you're, as you're building your management plan and you see all those different five elements, water, habitat, uh, food chain, genetics, and a harvest plan, think about each one of those in depth and take each one of those pieces and then study it and learn about it. You know, the very first thing, if there's ever a problem, my fish aren't growing or they're not feeding like they should or there's, uh, I've got a few fish dying, heaven forbid. The first thing I wanna do is rule out water. Make sure the water's happy. So check your water chemistry. It may mean, may mean nothing to you at the time you check it, but there are parameters you can see that make sure your water fits in those parameters for growing good fish or good plants or whatever you're after. You know, and then the next thing with the habitat, if you understand the lifestyles and the life cycles of all your fish, how do they spawn? What do they eat? Do they like to congregate? Are they ambush feeders? Do they live in schools? <clears throat> Once you can figure all that out about each species of fish, and I'm talking about bluegill, red ear, fathead minnows, golden shiners, threadfin shad, largemouth bass, Florida strain bass, smallmouth bass, yellow perch, hybrid stripers, walleye, you know, that's just the ones I can think of right off the top of my head. If you can crappie, you know, if you got a big enough lake for crappie, what kind of habitat do they need to be able to do what they need to do to be perpetual and involved in the dynamics of that fishery? And believe me, that fishery changes every day. You know, this time of year, fish are eating, well, all times of the year, fish are eating fish. Sometimes of the year, fish are reproducing. Other times, fish are growing. You know, some of these bait fish are gonna grow up to a certain size and then something's gonna eat them. So the dynamics are ongoing and part of your job is to monitor that. So keep some good data with your harvest, with, with your harvest part of this game plan. Weigh and measure some fish. Nothing takes the place of measuring and weighing fish. If, if you're catching 14 inch bass that weigh two pounds and you're not releasing them, you better be. But if you're catching 14 inch bass that weigh a pound and two ounces, out they go. You know, so you can be judging the body condition of your fish and getting data on those fish. Compare that to the food chain, which means a couple times a year, drag a seine through the shallow water, see what's reproducing, what's not. You know, which means you gotta learn how to identify the fish. You know, you gotta know the difference between a red ear and a bluegill and a hybrid sunfish and a green sunfish and a warm mouth and a, and a um, flyer. <laughs> if you know the differences and you can understand their lifestyles, that makes you a better manager and helps you be more successful with your game plan. Let's see here. Besides eelgrass, some other good plants, we talked about that a little bit. I love, uh, I, I, I tolerate bushy pondweed because it has a tendency to get really, really dense. I love Kara. A lot of people don't like Kara. I love Kara because it grows on a carpet, maybe this thick, you know, four to seven to eight inches thick on the bottom of hard water ponds. As long as there's Calcium carbonate in that water, care is gonna grow. And the, even though it may not be the best habitat for fish, it prevents other kinds of plants from growing that we don't like as much. So that's why I like to see care, especially in water that's only four inches to a foot and a half deep. Not a lot of fish live in that. Those that do, care is gonna be a safe harbor for a lot of insects a lot of nymphs, dragonfly nymphs, things like that, and tiny fish. So I love Kara, I love American pondweed, I tolerate bushy pondweed, uh, I love eelgrass, um, I've said American pondweed three or four times, I love that. So let's see here, Shepard Kennedy, recommendations for placement of five pound bacteria blocks. Slow moving water, inlet area, middle of the pond, or area most build up or other. Okay, for those of you that want to use um, beneficial microbes, their job is to break down organic matter. Now that could be fish waste, that could be oak leaves from last fall, could be oak leaves from this fall, could be maple leaves from this fall for all you guys up north. Uh, but we, I, I, when I, I use microbes in conjunction with enzymes, in conjunction with aeration. So the more that you can move the water, the better that those microbes can do. But if you don't have those options, I'd be tempted to put the bacteria blocks 
where the water is moving and where the organic matter is congregated. Now keep in mind, here's how bacteria works. There, there's not a pond out there that doesn't have good bacteria in it. The reason to add some bacteria to a pond is to expedite the process. Now what happens is bacteria, when it's got oxygen and it's got food, is going to reproduce exponentially. Double, then double, then double, then double, and then it, it does its job. And when it does its job and runs out of food, then it dies. You know, that's another reason I'm a real big fan of substrate for paraphyton and biofilm. That's why I love the floating islands. That's why I like rock. That's why I like wood. I like plastic. I like pallets. Because the paraphyton can grow, which is colonies of bacteria that do what they need to do. But to directly answer that question for my colleague in the pond management business, you know, you ought to come to the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology as well. There's going to be some pretty cool ex idea exchange at that if you don't mind shelling out the cash. It's 1500 bucks, boys. But the food's going to be good, and I got a great field trip lined up. I'll tell you more about that here in a minute. Um, slow moving water, inland area, middle of the pond. I would not put the bacteria in the middle of the pond. Now the reason, the reason I wouldn't is because if you put it in, like right now, above the thermocline, it's going to react and work better. If you throw it in the middle of the pond where the water's deep, it's going to run out of oxygen. You're not going to get the reproduction potential off of that bacteria block that you would, that you will in, uh, in a better area. Let's see here. Upcoming show, please talk about building a dock in an existing pond. Go to Tommy Docks. Go look up Tommy Docks. Look up Easy Docks. Look up, uh, go to the Pond Boss Resource Guide, pondboss.com. Click on the Resource Guide and go look there. There's some really, really good stuff. If you if you want a floating dock, there's there's a couple of different um, vendors that we that we love that are good at it. Let's see here. Ian Reynolds checking in. Brian Lawrence. Good to see Brian. Didn't see Brian in a while. Gary Hempel. Ideal bacteria will be a consortium which produces enzymes for each other. That's exactly right. And like what when I do what when I do inoculate a lake that's aerated and I use bacteria, I'll also put in some enzymes to stimulate their immediate reproduction and not wait on the pond to do it for it. There's uh, Chuck Brinkman checking in. Good to see Chuck and won't be dry. Okay, I'm going to tell you, it's uh, 722. I'm going to, everybody tell, I say everybody, my handler, not that I like to be handled that much, but uh, they tell me to, to promote myself. Well, I don't like that. I'm just not comfortable doing it. But I'm going to do it the best I can. On this Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology, uh, we're going to do a, a, a day-long basic pond management like 8 to 3 o'clock with a catered lunch. We'll be right here in the Pond Boss World Headquarters in the in the uh, conference room in there. And we're going to go through all those five things. We're going to go in-depth about water, habitat, the food chain, genetics, uh, and a harvest plan. We're going to talk about all that. Then we're going to go back to my house, which is about a mile and a half away, and we're going to uh, go through a little tour of the property, going to show you some fish, some ponds, some products. i got products coming. Then we're going to have a reception. Let everybody get to know each other. So far, I think we've got 11 people coming. 10 of them are signed up for the conference. One of them is a spouse. We have two couples so far. One couple, both of them want to attend. The other couple, one of them wants to go shopping. You know, and then we're going to have some great food. we got the menu lined out. It's going to be really, really, really good. And uh, I'd love for you to come. Then on Friday, I've got a couple of guest speakers. Mike Otto's coming. And... Sean McNulty, Dr. Sean McNulty from American Sport Fish Hatchery that produces F1 Tiger Bass. He's going to come talk about fish farms and producing fish commercially. And then I'm going to handle some things. And then uh, uh, we're going to do some hands-on stuff at my place. I've got eight ponds. I'm going to work on four or five of them and do some of this real practical hands-on stuff. Eat good. And then on uh, Saturday morning, we're going to have breakfast. Then we're going to go up the road about 60 miles north of us to Wildcat Springs Ranch, which is a 7,000 acre high fenced ranch with a 65 acre lake, a 20 acre lake, and some other smaller lakes and hatchery ponds. There we're gonna do some electrofishing, we're gonna run some nets, we're gonna do water chemistry, we're gonna tag fish, we're gonna do some market recapture studies, we're gonna be collecting data. And from that data, I'm gonna teach you 
how to analyze that data to reach the goals. That particular ranch, they want to break at least one Oklahoma State record out of five different species. And I'll share all that when you guys get here. So it's going to be really, really fun. Then we're going to come back to my house, spend a little time discussing what happened that day, and then small group time where everybody gets to exchange ideas. And we got people coming from all over the nation. We got a, one guy that uh, says he's coming. He hasn't paid up yet, but he's 82 years old and loves to learn. And I think we got a college student coming from uh, Midland, Texas. You know, so it's going to be fun for everybody to get together and exchange ideas because we're all going to have similar missions, similar goals, similar mindset, different ideas and different circumstances. So that's going to be pretty fun. Matter of fact, Jacob West and his dad Bobby are going to be here. Jacob's on this show all the time. And man, they got a cool spot out west of us in St. Joe, Texas. So we're going to get some stuff. Shepard Kennedy, we're going to get the details. Um, they're in Pond Boss Magazine, or if you will email me, boblusk at outlook.com, I'll send you a brochure. But we, if, if you, Shepard, if you get Pond Boss, which I think you do, uh, it's in the last couple of issues. So let's see here. And there's Jacob chiming in. Dick Tabbert's checking in. I haven't seen him in a while. Let's see. There's Chris Piper. Let's see. Been a while. Finally got to, I'm glad you got to see us live. I know you get to watch it on Memorex. <laughs> Let's see what else we got here. Jacob's putting, doing the hashtag. That's cool. Joe Sipes is checking in. Mark Cornwell. Hey, Mark. Good to see you, man. Mark Cornwell is the fish professor. For those of you that, that read the magazine, Mark has the fish professor article. And I met Mark way back in, I think, 2004. So he and I have been friends a long, long time. He's a professor, fisheries professor at uh, State University of New York at Cobble Skill in the Catskills. So Mark is just, he's, man, he's one of these professors that's, that he's in. He, I guarantee if he took his shoes off and looked under his toes somewhere, there's some pond mud from somewhere in the last two or three weeks. You know, cause, I mean, we don't scrape it out from under our toes. We wash it out. Isn't that right, Mark? <laughs> but Mark does an outstanding job. He really does. And I'm proud to call him a friend. I'm proud to, to, for you guys to know that he contributes to the magazine each issue. And he's out there teaching young brains about fisheries management, fisheries biology. One of the few schools in this whole nation that's got a hands-on practical application of get out in the field and actually do fish work instead of reading about it all the time. Look at there, there's Trip Home Rain. I haven't seen old Trip in years. Trip's down from around the San Antonio area. He's a humor writer. So let's see here. Um, Brian Lawrence about to start getting the watch now that it is getting darker earlier. Okay. About to start getting the watch, getting to watch now it's getting darker earlier. Yep, yep, it'll be darker earlier soon, won't it? Jason says, can I use one of those discs to determine the depth of eelgrass will grow? Yeah, you can do that. You sure can. Uh, Gary Hempel wants paddlefish. Paddlefish can be gotten from Osage Cat Fisheries up in the Ozarks, near Lake of the Ozarks. They are the, the go-to place to get paddlefish. Let's see, Micah, let's see, let's see. Micah says, what plants are desirable for ponds? We just went through that, but I'll tell you again. American pondweed, bushy pondweed we tolerate. We like uh, eelgrass. Uh, I like some of the bog plants like arrowhead. Uh, avoid hydrilla, avoid milf, Eurasian water milfoil, um, and any exotic plants. Coontail's a native plant, but I don't particularly care for coontail because by about year three, it's going to wear you out. All right, Chris Horsley, which would you stock? F1 tiger bass or Florida or another bass type? Well, I'm going to answer that based on where you are. So, Micah, if you are in Nebraska, I'm going to tell you to stock northerns. Now, I'm going to tell you that if it were legal, I'd say you might try some F1s in Nebraska, but they're not legal because they're not native species for that state. So be sure your state allows it. Now, here's the catch-22. Florida bass just don't thrive in cold water. And I, actually, I've seen them die in Texas lakes when we'd have a really hard, long cold snap. And it's the biggest fish that go. Uh, Echo Lake over in East Texas near Brownsboro held the state record for five or six years until we had a hard, hard cold snap in 1983, killed every big Florida bass in that lake. So F1s kind of mitigate that risk because they have northern genes. So it depends on your goals, where you are. And I like to use Floridas because you know the genetics and they're pure and they're gonna interbreed with your other fish. 
I like F1s for their aggressiveness and their potential to grow as large as both parents, you know, or bigger than either parent, you know, and because they can mitigate cold weather. You know, I like Northerns because they're going to live in pretty much every environment. So sometimes I mix them all up. Depending on where, if it's a lake in Oklahoma and that guy wants big fish, we're going to mix the genes up. Let's see here, 730, I'm going to wrap it up. Tim Stewart, my catch rates are terribly low right now. Likely just the weather, likely the only Florida strain. There's two reasons right there. Florida strain bass are typically uh, finicky. They don't really like to bite a hook, and they're real picky about what they'll eat. That doesn't mean they don't eat. They do, and they eat a lot. You know, so, and, and then when the temperature's so, so hot, you know, when you got 90 degree water, they're not going to bite much. Gary Hempel, perverse native Texas bass. Gotcha. Chris Piper, now that I have plenty of adult bluegill and catfish eating my feed, should I switch feed or keep feeding the MVP? I would keep feeding the MVP when you run out of it. Buy more MVP and buy some 600 and mix it with it. 600 is big pellets. And then if you want to convert them over, the thing about MVP, you're going to keep feeding the small fish that are reproduced in there. So you're going to perpetuate your reproduction and recruitment. Hey, at 731, I'm going to wrap it up. Thanks for watching, everybody. Great, fast-paced show. I appreciate the questions. Glad you guys are hanging in there and watching. I will see you next Wednesday. Until then, adios.